Do you want me to present you, or you can do it on your own? Okay. Since I can't, you know, since I can't thank Zohar for his kind presentation, uh, I'll thank him for something else. And this is the, you know, without going into the, you know, cliche or cliche of, you know, I'm the last speaker before lunch. I'll just thank Zohar for the confidence that he has in me, and, you know, giving me the opportunity to be the last speaker before uh, lunch. Um, You know, so this is one challenge, and the other challenge is actually using both hands in the same presentation, one for the mic and the other for, uh, okay. So this is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to uh, explain why um, perhaps another way to look at what Avremi has described is a, you know, a system that what I will try and argue has worked uh, or was structured in a way that worked to benefit controlling shareholders and at some point just uh, hit back. And, and, or in other words, I agree with Avremi that the problem is that we have uh, the infrastructure, the legal infrastructure for dealing with bond workouts in Israel is in a need of reform and I'll try to explain why. And, and this is based uh, on a joint project with Yosef Kalmanovich who is now uh, uh, the assistant of uh, Neil Handel at the Supreme Court. So a, a little bit of a background about the market for publicly traded debt in Israel. So starting from roughly the beginning of the 21st century, we had a very uh, a rapid growth of the market for publicly traded uh, debt, driven by many reasons. One of them is, is uh, pension reforms and privatization of the pension sector. So a little bit of, you know, Examples, this is taken from the recent Andoran Committee. Uh, in 2003, uh, uh, corporate credit uh, by institutional investors just was, you know, 7% of total corporate credit. In 2007, it was 29%. And, you know, this by itself could be a topic for discussion. There are many background factors that need to be taken into account. All or virtually all of those uh, bonds uh, you know, if you wanted to be generous with them, you would describe them as covenant light. Uh, uh, and this is one of the features of the IDB case. Uh, there are many issues about pricing, whether the risk was priced. There are many issues about whether companies were over uh, leveraged to begin with. I'd like to focus on one background fact, which I think is important here, and I hate to take you back to the MFW case, but once you need to restructure the debt of a company with a controlling shareholder. There is a fundamental conflict between the controlling shareholder and maybe the company's interest or debtor's interest or creditor's interest because if you think about kind of the classic example of how do you organize a company, it's a debt for equity exchange. Uh, here you run into the difficulty of a controller who stands in a position to lose its control over the company and that's why, especially if the company is worth preserving, that's where you had the, I think, most severe conflict because the controlling shareholder, whether it's a company or an individual, would work very hard to preserve uh, control. And our claims uh, in, in, in this project is that the prevailing regime, and this is more of an academic point, uh, kind of blurs the lines or the boundary between what we could think of as out of bankruptcy debt workouts and bankruptcy arrangement. And in most of the cases, this kind of uh, blurring the lines works in favor of uh, uh, the controlling shareholders, and the IDB is perhaps an exception. And you know, once, if you buy our argument, the solution is, is, is kind of straightforward. You need to reestablish that boundary and have clear uh, 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 you know, distinction between out of court or out of bankruptcy uh, workouts for bondholders and you know, the messy world of bankruptcy, whether it's liquidation or reorganization. So just, in, you know, as an example, let's take one of a relatively old uh, debt restructuring case. Uh, Africa Israel uh, Investments had a, you know, $7.5 billion of face value of debt, 13 series of bonds. I checked last night was the plural for serious, just to make sure, and it's, you know, serious. Um, 
fundamentally, the way the, the, the workout worked is that you know, bondholders got paid in cash. Uh, uh, new, two new notes were issued instead of the 13 that they had previously. They got some stock of the company and the subsidiaries. Why the subsidiaries, by the way? You know, because the controller wanted to stay, I guess, that's my guess, wanted to stay in control. And, you know, the controller didn't keep, get to keep his contro its control for free. It paid, you know, 300 million shekels and then got uh, some sort of an option to reinvest uh, more. I think it, it reinvested ultimately all of the money that he had the option to invest and control got preserved. And this is a... You know, this is not a typical in many of those debt restructuring cases. And this is a partial view of the data. You know, look at the 27 cases here. Controller remains in control and gets some discharge of liability. And the question is, you know, the question is, can we, can we say that something is wrong once controller stays in control? Is, is, do we have any deviation from the absolute priority rule? The answer is we can't tell. We can't tell because in most of those cases, the controller actually had to invest uh, in the company in order to buy back, sort of speak, its control. So we're still looking at those cases empirically. But let's go back to a more fundamental claim. Um, if you look at the literature, there is a distinction between debt workouts, out of bankruptcy workouts, and bankruptcy arrangements. Think about a syndicated loan uh, uh, arrangement. Company needs to renegotiate its debt. You know, the lenders get together and negotiate with the company. Don't enter into bankruptcy in order to uh, uh, re reorganize the debt. And you have bankruptcy world that tends to be costlier, messier, and uh, uh, much more beneficial for lawyers. And what we also have in the bankruptcy world is that once we're not in the zone of bankruptcy or in the zone of insolvency, but we're actually in bankruptcy, the assumption is, you know, it's not about contract rights, it's not about property rights, it's some sort of a collective mechanism. Everyone has to kind of, you know, give away uh, some of the rights that it had bargained for in order to, for us to promote the collective good of the creditors or the company. What happens when you have publicly traded bonds? We have the problem that, you know, bonds are publicly traded, it has its own advantages, you get liquidity, you can diversify more easily, but it's much more difficult to arrive at kind of uh, agreed upon uh, uh, debt workouts. What is the optimal regime? You know, there is some sort of a dispute here, there are different approaches. The US approach basically says, you know, we have no debt workouts out of bankruptcy for uh, a publicly traded bond. The UK approach takes the other uh, 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 end of the spectrum. It says whatever you negotiate for in the indenture is fine. And some countries like Germany adopt specific supermajority votes for uh, um, bond workouts. So if we look at the bankruptcy versus non-bankruptcy world and, it, and we take kind of the US federal regime, then there's no workout you either pay in full or you enter into kind of the bankruptcy world and, and I'm not discussing here the, the ways to go kind of to bypass these rules by exit consents and so on. What happens under Israeli law? We used to think we have some sort of out of, you know, a, a way to restructure debt without going through courts. That's no longer the case. We have section 350 of the Companies Act uh, built or based upon the UK scheme of arrangement model that says that you need to get uh, votes of shareholders, bondholders, or creditors, and if the arrangement gets approved by a majority in number and 75%, that's missing here in value, and approved by the court, then it's binding on all uh, uh, the creditors and the shareholders involved. So why do we think that what happened in Israel was some sort of a bankruptcy light regime? So let's start with the bankruptcy-like features of this regime. So although it's a debt workout, uh, and although we now have, and now we're only left with one representative here, although we now have the economic division at the Tel Aviv District Court, it's not the 
corporate law uh, uh, judges who adjudicate these cases, it's the bankruptcy judges who adjudicate these cases. You know, even if there's no insolvency uh, 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 determination. Second, the reality until, I would say, IDB perhaps, and, and, and to some extent even afterwards, was that co what companies would do would say, well, we stop paying interest, we stop making interest payments on our debt, and now let's negotiate, and now let's negotiate uh, 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 and find a way to restructure our debts. Uh, our data show, and that's consistent with the findings of the Andoran Committee, if somebody really cares, is that on average, the time from the announcement of the negotiation until final confirmation is 363 days, during which the company doesn't pay its debt. If I have time, I'll explain why, you know, perhaps what are the reasons. Now, you could say, well, that's not kind of a legal problem. That's the creditors who don't insist. That's the creditors who don't insist on kind of making the, forcing the companies to pay. But we have some court cases where the company uh, had secured creditors as well, and the secured creditors tried to you know, collect on their secured claims. And the company went to the bankruptcy court and said, look, you know, we're negotiating with our bondholders right now. So you know, we think that if the secured creditors actually did go along and, and, and you know, uh, exercise its rights, that would frustrate our discussion with our bondholders. And what the court did in, in one of those cases, it said, well, you know, I don't like this request of the company. If you want a stay, you need to ask for a stay. You need to enter into kind of the equivalent of Chapter 11 and ask for a stay. You didn't ask for it. But nevertheless, the secured creditors, you know, I ordered them. They can't do anything without kind of, you know, getting court approval. So this is no longer just a kind of economic reality fact. It's the courts themselves kind of, you know, on the one hand, recognizing the fact that this is some sort of an intermediate regime. On the other hand, imposing limits on secured creditors without having uh, any st you know, formal stay of proceedings. You know, think about the Africa example, and I'll get back to that in a second. We had 13 series of, of bonds. The courts classified all the series of bonds into a single class for voting purposes. Looks a lot like cram down. Uh, Discharge from liability, you know, although it's not a formal bankruptcy procedure, the reasoning, I'll get to that in a second. So all of these features, all of these features look very much like you know, what we would see in any other bankruptcy uh, arrangement. What we don't see is any court official appointed. Now, our point is not that you know, the U.S. system is superior to the European system, that you know, it's, it's kind of the optimal rule calls for uh, uh, you know, a company in Chapter 11 or organization to have someone appointed. Our point is a point about consistency. You know, if the prevailing regime in Israel generally states, and I know that's not such an accurate statement anymore, but if the prevailing regime at least asks a court to consider appointing a, a, an official, in those cases, in most you know, in most cases, it wasn't even addressed. Even when some bondholders filed a request, you know, they asked the court, and, and the case here is Delek Nadlan, you know, they went to the court and said, look, the negotiation takes too long. You know, the company kind of, in, you know, we don't know what's going on with the company. Can you please appoint some official to kind of supervise the company? This request uh, uh, was denied. And again, I said that the, the you know, debtor in possession is not the norm in Israel. I don't have a lot of time to address those questions, th those points, but what we don't see, and this is perhaps what kind of raises some sort of concern, we don't see any deadline, and we don't see any active bidding process uh, going on. And, and in, many, you know, in many of those cases, what the controlling shareholder got was de facto exclusivity when it comes to making the bid uh, 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 in order to buy control of the company. Uh, just an example of courts actually knowing uh, uh, what they're doing. This is the you know, Africa-Israel investment case. This is the original version. This is my translation, so uh, uh, in case you were confused. Uh, one of the questions there was, for voting purposes, you know, should the court decide that all 13 series of bondholders should be, you know, 
grouped together into a single group, although the company you know, was not declared insolvent, it, you know, it argued that it wasn't insolvent, and the court actually said, you know, explicitly recognized what it was doing, it said, well, you know, it's section 350, we know, we know that although this is not formally a bankruptcy process, we need to use the collective tools of bankruptcy in order to minimize harm to shareholders and creditors. So if we go back to that, this chart, I think in Israel what one could argue is that, especially when it comes to publicly traded bonds, especially when it comes to publicly traded bonds, this border has shifted, has shifted in that direction, bankruptcy or de facto bankruptcy or bankruptcy light, you should call it, you know, you can call it whatever you want, is, is introduced much earlier into the process. A um, couple of words about IDB. I think you know, one way to look at IDB case is, is kind of the other, you know, one way to look at the IDB case is this is a case where you know, a, a, a regime that was very, I would say, friendly to controlling shareholders because they could enjoy de facto stay without having a court official appointed which takes their control away from them. This is a case where the system actually uh, uh, worked against the controlling shareholder because what happened was that some, you know, if, if courts treat those cases, although they're formally not bankruptcy cases, as bankruptcy cases, then why not, you know, why give uh, the controlling shareholder exclusivity on the right, uh, on the right to uh, bid on the company? You know, this is kind of the other kind of side of the coin of, of Abremi's argument. Avremi was against having the creditors uh, uh, retain some sort of exclusivity on bidding, but why, you know, if the company is insolvent, why the, credit, why the controlling shareholder should have uh, exclusivity, which takes us to another issue, and I agree with, Avre with Avremi on that point. The legislator, you know, did try to implement Chapter 11 in Israel. It just left outside all the questions about exclusivity and who gets to bid when. And this is something that should be addressed by the legislature and not by the court. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, we think, as a positive argument, the existing regime confuses uh, two separate collective action problems, the one faced by uh, bondholders and the collective action problems that are unique to bankruptcy. Generally, we think it tends to favor uh, uh, the company, and if it has a controlling shareholder, the controlling shareholder, although that's not necessarily the case, because part of the problem is that it creates a lot of uncertainty, and that could be turned against uh, controlling shareholders. Uh, you, 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 can think, you can think that debtor in possession, or a regime where, and although I'm insolvent, uh, the controller keeps its control, at least for a certain period of time, is the desirable regime. You can think that it's not a desirable regime. Our claim is mostly about consistency. You can't have you know, the fact that your creditors are publicly, you know, are pub are those who held publicly traded bonds should not create that difference. And our proposal, you know, once we've identified the problem, is quite, I think, uh, uh, simple. We should have a market track for bond workouts, um, not, you know, we don't believe in the U.S. regime that says it's, it's strictly forbidden. There should be some supermajority uh, voting requirement for companies wishing to re renegotiate with their bondholders. Taking courts outside the picture, that should be kind of the easy track. And again, some companies have already adopted that regime. And for companies that find it too complicated, and we think it will be complicated for many companies, we should apply the traditional uh, uh, bankruptcy regime, whether it's reorganization or liquidation, and not create unique insolvency rules just for publicly traded bonds. Thank you very much.